All right. Well, welcome everybody to today's webinar. Don't forget sales tax during the yearly close and don't forget your pecan pie or banana pudding. So my name is Gary Dehart. I am the publisher of Insightful Accountant and host of today's webinar. A couple of housekeeping items before I turn this over. Uh, we are um, offering CPE for this webinar. And so just like with all other webinars that qualify for CPE, you must be present for 50 minutes, five zero minutes, and you must participate in at least three of the poll questions. 50 minutes and three questions. If you meet the minimum criteria, we will send you your CPE certificate via email within about 24 hours. Usually it goes out by this evening, but give us 24 hours. If you don't hear from, if you don't receive it, check your spam and then reach out to us if you have not received it. This, uh, this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to our YouTube channel. I will put the link to that channel in the chat once I get off the screen. And we will also send it to you along with a copy of the presentation of the slide deck uh, via email as well. And I'll post that uh, presentation into the chat as well once I get off the screen. So today's speakers are Mary and Stephanie Thomas. They are not twins, right? Yeah, right. right. <laughs> but I know one's older, but we don't talk about age, so we can't do that. We'll get in trouble. So Mary Thomas, Mary, raise your hand, Mary. Right here. Mary, Mary. So Mary is an attorney. She's a CPA and an attorney with over 20 years of experience in the sales and use tax industry, providing sales tax to help for help sales tax help for businesses, large and small. She has experience performing sales tax research in all 50 states as well as overseas and conducts educational seminars on sales tax. Stephanie, hey Stephanie. Stephanie is a CPA and she has dedicated her career to sales and use tax analysis. She routinely works with auditors and clients to minimize sales tax deficiencies when audits occur and teaches clients how to achieve sales and use tax compliance. She teaches, and this is right, Texas taxes for the construction industry, right? That is absolutely right, Gary. And uh, she's also, uh, and she's most proud when her clients graduate, meaning they achieve sales and use tax compliance. So Welcome to both of you. Thank you uh, for sharing your knowledge with us over the next 50 minutes, plus or minus. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. I'm going to bounce off the screen and turn it over to the two of you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yes, we are going to have some fun. So everybody just sit back and relax because you're going to get a ba good basic framework of how sales tax impacts your, your yearly close and just a good overall feel a framework for it. So let's start off with what sales tax is about. Well, actually, we're going to do the learning objectives. You are, it's, our learning objectives are for you to be able to identify and reconcile key financial data at the end of the year, understand the adjusting journal entries. We're going to talk a little bit about credit and debit card exposure. And one of our favorite topics that is misunderstood a lot, and that is taxable Tax purchases. purchases. And that's something that... You, those are things you want to think about at the end of the year. And so our agenda is going to follow our objectives. I'm a very linear thinker. So we're going to follow the line and we'll just go off onto little rabbit trails every once in a while if we are guided to do so by your questions. So there is one disclaimer that I need to make right away. And that is when I speak about sales tax, I know that you guys are accountants and bookkeepers. When I say you, sometimes I go between you as the client and you as the bookkeeper because I always consider us being the accountants and bookkeepers to be on the team of the client. If I ever say something that is unclear or if you get confused, let me know and I will clean it up. But I do lump us as the service provider sometimes with the client. I will try to keep that clear for everybody involved, okay? So sales tax is about, and we had a wonderful segue, thanks to Gary. The theme of our presentation is pie. It is, and you can tell she had it on the brain. Because sales tax is all about state taxing authorities getting paid. They want their piece of your pie. And so everything that you do as it relates to sales and use tax is about making sure that if you are ever audited by any taxing authority, that you can prove to them to their satisfaction that they got their piece of your pie. 
And so with that, we're gonna jump off into the first thing, which is we're gonna talk about the summary accounts and different, and different sales channels and source documents. And so Stephanie? Okay, so um, let's talk about summary accounts and your sales channel. If you're ever audited, and when I say you, like Mary stated before, I'm talking about your clients. If your client is ever audited, what the taxing authority wants to do, the main focus is to make sure that they capture all of the sales figures. So you have to make sure that whatever is in your accounting system, your summary reports and accounts matches what is in your, chale, your sales channels. And that is their goal. They wanna make sure everything is captured. And I always say that it's very good for you to periodically go through your sales channels and the reports that you see there and follow it through to your accounting system. For example, if you have a sale on Monday, go look at that, see, make sure it rolls into the daily summary report, and then make sure that daily summary report rolls into the monthly reports that are normally what is used to um, prepare your sales and use tax return, and make sure all that transfers over to your accounting software that everything is captured in your GL because you don't want to have issues where things don't follow through the way that they need to follow through. The other thing is we have source documents here. The monthly reports, the daily reports are very, very important because that's what you're going to use when you file your sales and use tax returns. But source documents are key. So you need to make sure that you also have access to purchase invoices, to sales invoices, to contracts, you, uh, receipts. You have to make sure that you have source documents because that is what auditors, auditors look for all the time. In terms of your sales channels, make sure, Mary has this phrase that she always loves, which is garbage in, garbage out. In terms of your sales channel, you need to make sure that all of the appropriate fields are populated. And when I say the appropriate fields, you need to make sure that you have the shipping address. That's important. That's, that, that is a huge area that auditors look at when it relates to taxability. The shipping address, um, if separately stated sales tax was charged and any fees that you may have charged. I ran across a client where they combined the fees that they charged and the sales tax into one category. Now that is a nightmare to unravel. When you are dealing with the tax and authority, they wanna make sure that one, they've captured all the sales and two, that you have reported sales tax on taxable sales and that you reported the right amount of sales tax. So if you have combined um, a fee as well as the sales tax that you charge, you're going to have to unravel that. I always like to say, uh, uh, what is it that saying an uh, ounce of prevention is worth a, a pound of cure? Yeah. If you actually have it set up via your sales channels where it's very clear what sales tax you charge on a transaction versus what fee you charge on a transaction, that will make unraveling that a whole lot easier for you and less of a headache. Because let me tell you, it was a headache to deal with to try to unravel that. And that leads me to bookkeep and other interfaces with where you have the sales channel. It, you must be able to have all your sales captured and flowing to your general ledger, your accounting programs. And you must have an interface that works for you and your needs and your business. And that is that's the big thing here. And so one of the things that we're talking about is when we're talking about the theme, the reason that you're seeing ingredients on this particular slide is that the key ingredient in all of this is your source documents. Mm -hmm. It's the linchpin of what's flowing through the information in your sales channel, what's going to bookkeep and, what, and what's ultimately in your accounting system. So let's talk about this a little bit. What the way that it flows is when someone comes into your client's shop or they purchase something, there is some, there's some 
app that is capturing that cell. And that's the first thing that you see on the left-hand okay, side of the chart. Then that information, that daily information from your various channels flows into Bookkeep, which gives the owner a daily summary of what is going on with their business. A lot of people love to see daily what is going on with their business. And then that information flows into the accounting system. Well, the accounting system is what you're using as the linchpin for how to for what you're reporting to the state taxing authority and every other taxing authority mm -hmm. or banking institution, whoever you're making reports to. That's where you're pulling your information. What is key is that you've got to make sure that all of the systems are actually re reflecting the sales that are being made for each person or each entity that is doing business with you. Exactly. So with that, we're up to the first poll question. All right, so how often do you check the mapping of your apps? Once per year, once per quarter, once a month, once a week, or never, nobody does that. And just while you uh, while you do answer these, we do um, want to encourage you, if you do have questions, put them into the Q&A. Uh, the chat is disabled, uh, as somebody did remind me that, but put your questions in the Q&A and then we'll get to them uh, at the appropriate time. So we'll leave this open for about uh, five more seconds. And again, if you want to uh, receive the CPE, you do need to participate in at least three of these polls. So we're going to close this out in about three, two, and one. Thank you. Okay. All right, that's about normal. That's about normal, once a year, once per quarter. Oh, that is excellent. Once a month, that's even better. Never, that's about, that's about normal. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone. Let's see. And so what we're going to talk about now is we're going to talk about the importance of reconciling those key summary accounts. We just give you a little bit of a background as, in, as it relates to the key ingredient being what's going on with the summary documents and making sure that you capture everything that is going on as it relates to not only the sales, but the purchases that you're making. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how the taxing authority looks at your records when they're doing an audit and distill it down to what you need to be doing at the end of every year, at least to make sure that you're accounting for things in a way that doesn't raise red flags. Exactly. So the key here is to reconcile key summary accounts. As we stated before, taxing authorities want to make sure that they are capturing all of your sales. That is very, very important. And in order for them to do that, they look at various different things, including your federal income tax returns. They also look at your corporate tax returns and your sales and use tax returns. And they compare all of the sales numbers on those three different returns to see if they match up. Now, there are legitimate reasons why they wouldn't, but, and that can range from you having exports or out-of-state sales, whatever reason. But the thing about it is you have to, you or your client has to be able to explain why those numbers do not match. For example, if on your federal income tax returns, you have that there was sales of $5 million, but on your state sales tax returns, you have that there were sales of $3 million, the auditor is going to know what is the other, where are the other $2 million worth of sales? What do they relate to? Why doesn't it match up with what is on that sales tax return? And you need to be able to explain what the differences are. What a lot of people don't realize is that, oh, I know we all realize it because we work with accountants and we, and we are accountants and we work with the closing of the books. The person that does the federal income tax returns typically is the person that does the corporate tax returns. 
I haven't seen those people be different folks. So usually what happens with that is those numbers match. If $5 million is being reported as, and we're going to say that, that this particular client does all their business in California. If $5 million is being reported as to the federal government, it's also being reported to the California Taxing Authority as the sales level for corporate tax return purposes. What happens is there's usually a disconnect between that number that is reported to the IRS and the corporate tax authority. There's a disconnect with what was reported to the taxing authority that governs sales tax returns. Because depending on the frequency with which your client files sales tax returns, that is done monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, sometimes annually if they're really small. Those numbers can change based on information that comes in later. For instance, if you have if you have a sale that you booked, but then it later didn't happen, it can be normal for those numbers not to match. At the end of the year, what you have to do is go in and make sure that the total sales that your client reported throughout the year actually matches what was reported via the federal income tax returns in the corporate tax returns that is actually matching what's in your accounting system. And if, the, if they don't match, you have to be able to explain why they don't. Exactly, because in the example that I just said, I said the client was wholly in California. Well, if you have a client that's in multiple jurisdictions, then the number on the federal income tax return is going to be bigger than the number that you're going to report on that federal the state tax the return, state the tax state, return yeah, the state sales me. tax return the state tax return the corporate one and the sales and use tax one mm -hmm. so there's one example that i ran into with a client and that this client made beautiful custom things and she is in one state she had a layaway program and the bookkeeper she booked the cash that was received when the people made the deposit and she was going to book the rest of the money when the person actually came in and paid the balance due. This person over the course of four years forgot to go in and report to the state taxing authority the cash that was received when the people came in and paid the balance due. Our client had four years of being required to pay the sales tax based on those sales, that portion that this young lady neglected to report to the mm -hmm. taxing authority. And the reason I tell the story is that that snafu would have been caught immediately if anyone had gone in and reconciled the information, the level of sales that were reflected on the federal income tax returns in the accounting records on the state franchise tax report, it would have all shaken out if they had done that reconciliation and if they had done it yearly. Mm -hmm. So that's something to really be aware of in terms, because you never want someone to have the reaction that our client had in terms of asking the bookkeeper, what happened here? I thought that, I thought that this was covered because it was a material amount of money because it's, it's stockpiled. It was a four-year look back. Mm -hmm. And with sales and use tax, there's a three to four year look back. So that's just something for you to be aware of. And when we say that auditors know what's in the federal income tax return, they know because it's one of the documents that they ask for when they come in. Yes. And I've tried to get out of providing that to them, but they're very, very persnickety about it and they want it and they won't let it go. So that's just something to, to keep under your hat that nine times out of 10, you're going to have to provide that information to an auditor because they use it in various different ways. I think, yeah, I think it's baseline. I don't think they're letting anybody out of and it. I don't think so either. They, they want that return. It's, it's a check figure for them. And so in addition to doing that reconciliation as it relates to the information that's in the federal income tax report, 
and the franchise or corporate income tax report, there are other key accounts for you to look at at the end of the year too. Exactly. And one huge one is your sales tax accrual account. And we all know that the sales tax accrual account is the account where you put all the money that you, all the sales tax that you collected from your clients. If that account does not clear out, there is an issue. If you have huge balances in that account or just weird things going in and out, that is something that auditors always scrutinize. And sometimes there are various different reasons why you can have balances in there. You, it will never completely zero out just from the nature of sales tax. But there are sometimes you have timely filer discounts or just something weird that's gone on. If something strange is, is going on or there are different adjustments, that you've made, there, need, there needs to be some kind of trail as to why that adjustment was made into that account. Because if it isn't, you're gonna have an issue in, when an audit comes around. The other thing is, is we have talked about how the taxing authority wants to make sure that they capture all of your sales that they need to capture. So that's why they look at your federal income tax returns and the corporate tax returns and your sales and use tax returns and your GL to make sure everything has been captured. Well, once they are satisfied that all sales have been captured, they whittle down to, okay, the sales have been captured. I feel good about that. Uh, now I might need to categorize the sales. Is it a taxable sale? Is it a non-taxable sale? If it is a taxable sale, then, you know, that's one bucket. Non-taxable sale is a different bucket. And if you have a lot of non-taxable sales, you need to make sure that it's very clear why you did not tax those sales. It could be for various different reasons, uh, who the customer was, maybe they, maybe there is an exemption as to relating what was being sold. Whatever it is, you must be able to prove to the tax authority that you handled that non-taxable sale correctly. And you must also retain any documentation that you should have um, received in order to substantiate the tax-free nature of that sale. And that includes certificates and things like that. They must be properly completed and, and all that good stuff. So when we talk, about, so when Stephanie said that due to the nature of the sales tax accrual account, it won't clear out necessarily, she's right. Think about it this way. When you're looking at the end of the year at that sales tax accrual account, just make sure that if your client is filing on a monthly basis, if their system is saying that they collected $50,000 worth of sales tax, that in the following month, $50,000 worth of sales tax is being reported to the state. And if not, why not? What happened? If they took a credit, why did they take a credit? Mm -hmm. If a sale didn't happen, document it. Mm -hmm. Whatever, if you took a timely filing discount or a prepayment discount, make sure that you have a trail of it. We ran into an auditor who wanted to categorize a timely filing discount as tax collected, not, not remitted, remitted, because it took a minute for us to just say, wait a minute, this 5% is exactly the amount of the discount. So you just want to make sure that you have all of that very clear. Mm -hmm. And there's another thing too about the sales. When we asked the first polling question about how often do you, how often do you look at the mapping? Our wonderful friends at Bookkeep suggested that it's good to do it at least once a month. Mm -hmm. If you can't do it once a month, hey, life happens. At least once a year at the, at the very yeah, outside. Yeah. A lot of people will map everything one time and never look at it again. Rules change. So you want to go back in and just make sure. Because when you get audited, one of the things they're going to do is, like Stephanie said, you've got the taxable sale bucket you got the non-taxable sale bucket. Mm -hmm. When you are automated, it's easier for an auditor to go in and find a mistake and then just extrapolate it. And you've got, you've got a large number or a larger number. And we talked about the key accounts of the sales tax accrual account, 
the taxable sales, because that's one of the numbers that you actually declare on the sales and use tax report. Depending on how your clients do business, there are various other, other key accounts, accounts that you yeah. want to go in and reconcile. All of us know everybody's accounting system is different. Mm -hmm. And I've seen people go do things that were counterintuitive to me, but they came up with the right result. What yeah. they were doing was gap. So just make sure that for each client that you have that identify the key accounts, go in and reconcile them. And just always keep in mind that you have to make sure that what's in those summary accounts that you are basing all of your reports on, they actually reflect what is going on as it relates to the source documents. And even further back, what's going on with that sale that produced that source document. Exactly. And so now we're going to talk about summary documents and things that can account for balance changes that people, it can sometimes throw you off. And it's something that you want to document as you end the year so that if you are in a situation where you or your client are called to explain account balance changes, you can actually do that. And we have run into situations where a summary number will be one number in one system and a different number in and another system. system. And we've had to make those reconciliations and explain those changes. And like we said before, they wanna make sure they're capturing all your sales and they're comparing the different numbers in the different systems. And one reason, one reason why there could be some discrepancies there is because of bad debt. So you have to make sure that it's very clear if you've written off something. And when I say make sure it's clear, we don't ask, and when I say we, I've dealt with so many different taxing authorities. They're not really loving the whole summary numbers and summary amounts when it relates to bad debts. They want you to drill down to, Mary didn't pay me this invoice, this amount. So you need to be very specific as it relates to sales and use tax compliance when it relates when it comes to bad debt. And just if it's very clear that you made an adjustment because of bad debt, have it in your work papers. Make the notation somewhere. If Mary hits the Powerball and she runs off someplace, we want to make sure that you know three years down the line that if you're ever that if I'm audited it's very clear why this adjustment was made. It's, it was made because of bad debt. It was because this customer didn't pay this invoice and, they, and I had to make the adjustment. And there's one thing about that that's very interesting to me is we have a rather large client and they have a bad debt write-off that is kind of a percentage mm -hmm. and, and their accounting firm handles that and that's all right with the IRS and that's that's great, mm -hmm. groovy. But that don't flow down here with the state tax and authority. The auditor could have been tougher than she was in yeah. terms of we want to make sure that this specific invoice was written off. We didn't have that. She accepted it anyway. She didn't have to. So that's something that if someone is writing off a bad debt and it is material, I think most of us, depending on the size of our clients, we know which which invoices constitute the bad debt mm -hmm. just make sure that as the clients get bigger that you have a trail I think you want to have that trail no matter how big they are yeah. but it gets tougher as they get bigger because you're dealing with different laws that are parallel but don't necessarily touch sales tax is not the same as federal income okay. tax and some of the rules and some of the documentation things that we have to do to satisfy a state taxing authority can be more picky than what's going on with the IRS. Exactly. Another reason why we, what you have in one system may not match um, another is the accounting basis. Because sometimes you have uh, you know, clients that report sales tax on the cash basis but their federal income tax return is on the accrual basis or, you know, another basis, because I've run across that as well. Hybrids. Yes, hybrids. The, the big takeaway is that it's okay for them to have, to report on different bases. It's completely okay. 
but you have to be able to explain those differences to an auditor because they're looking at the, the amounts. And the big thing, I think the big thing is that if the amount of sales that you have on your sales and use tax return is significantly less yes. than what's uh, on your federal income tax return and your corporate tax return, you're going to have to explain why. Okay. Yeah. So it could be various different reasons, like we said before, but you have to be able to explain that to an auditor to their satisfaction. And I think I've only, I only remember one client who did this, but they were reporting on the accrual basis to the federal, to the federal income mm -hmm. tax, to the IRS, but they were reporting on the cash basis to, to the, the state, state taxing authority. And we were looking at the numbers and this was a long time ago. So we don't do this anymore. It's one of the first questions you find out. We were looking and I was like, why are these numbers so different? Click the button uh, that it, there's a there's a button um, in within, QuickBooks, in QuickBooks in that'll QuickBooks, take yeah. it from accrual to cash. Always keep track of that because it really makes a huge it difference. Does. I don't think, I think very few people do that anymore. But the reason that people, especially on the state tax side, if they're contractors or depending on what they're doing, they like cash basis because they don't have to pay the taxing authority until they actually, actually get the money right. themselves. Mm -hmm. And depending on what the profit margins are, it can make a big difference depending on what industry you're in. But pay attention to that in terms of what's their accounting basis. And some people use a hybrid. Yes, I've run across that as well, where, where they use a hybrid method as it relates to, to the federal income tax return. And it's something and completely the, different. Uh, and the corporate tax return. Yeah. And it's something completely different than what they use to report their sales and use tax. Because now, because depending on the jurisdiction, they can be very specific about what accounting basis they want you to use to report sales and use tax. And I know down here in Texas, there's a rule that you can use a hybrid system only if you get permission first. Mm -hmm. So if you have a client that's starting out and accrual or cash basis, either one of them doesn't quite fit what they need. If you're going to do some hybrid before you pull the trigger on that, make sure that you understand what that state taxing authority is allowing you to do. And understanding that accounting basis is one of the key things as it relates to doing their books at the end of the year anyway, which I know all y'all know. Yeah. The other thing that can account for um, differences in different sales levels, depending on which report you're looking at could be refunds. And you need to document that. If, if a credit was issued to a customer, a refund was issued to a customer, it's important that it flows through to the different reports. But like Mary said, the federal income tax return and the corporate tax return, they're done at the end of the year, mm -hmm. okay? But your sales and use tax return for a lot of different uh, clients is done monthly. So you have adjustments there. Do so you just need to make sure that everything is documented appropriately and that if you're making an adjustment relating to a refund or a rebate, that you have it in the work papers what that adjustment relates to. So have so any changes, make sure they flow through, that you have them at the source. Mm -hmm. So if you issued a credit memo, you've got the credit memo, it's in your, it's in your sales channel documentation. It is in bookie. It's and it's in your actual accounting, accounting system, records, yeah. so that all those numbers tie. Most of the time they don't, but if you look at what is going on with your client and you're looking at key accounts at the end of the year, specifically the ones that we told you about, and any more that you identify based on what's going on with your client, you will be able to catch some of that. Yeah. You'll be able to catch material yeah. instances of it because nothing's perfect. It's okay if your client owes a little bit, but you just want to stop the bleeding as it relates to owing a whole lot. Exactly. And so here's one of my favorite topics. Yes. I know y'all think I'm a nerd. That's okay. It's understanding, adjusting journal entries. Yes. And, you know, we focused on making sure you understand that auditors look at sales. They look at purchases as well. They also look at the journal entries that you're doing and when they're uh, impacting various different accounts. 
And so we all have been there with the trash can accounting and, and where, you, where you want something to balance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you maybe put in a number into a, in an account to make something else balance out. We all know as accountants and bookkeepers, that's a no-no that you try to avoid doing it, but sometimes you just, you get it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those things. This is, this is a story that actually happened to us is a client was being audited. They made these huge entries to fixed asset accounts. Mm -hmm. And the auditor said, okay, I see $200,000 hitting this fixed asset account, the equipment account. It's adding to that equipment account. Um, I'm going to assume this it, that this is a sale, a taxable, a, a a taxable, taxable purchase, purchase, excuse me, a taxable purchase until you prove to me that it's not. And we went back and we asked the client, said, what is this? Did y'all buy, did y'all buy this much equipment? And they said, no. no. Our accountant decided that there were some balances that needed to be cleared out. And this was just part of that accounting entry. And we're sitting there thinking, so there's nothing going on here, but you were cleaning up the books. Mm -hmm. And they said, yes. Y'all know that didn't fly. Yeah, you can't really tell that to an auditor. Oh, well, you know, this entry into the equipment account really does not represent the purchase of equipment. <laughs> they will laugh you out of town, okay, as they schedule it on the audit. So try to avoid trash can accounting, especially when it impacts accounts of interest, which are the sales, the miscellaneous sales accounts, as well as your purchases, including fixed assets, because they are always going to be making sure that not only did you charge the appropriate sales tax on your sales to customers, that you pay, and they, they're going to make sure that you pay the appropriate sales tax or use tax on your purchases. So when you're making journal entries that's hitting those various different accounts, you need to make sure you have the appropriate backup because they're going to be looking at that. And like Mary said, with her example of the equipment where they added in what, $200,000 of equipment? Yeah. Well, they saw that that, that that was added. And that presumption is, Oh, that's taxable. You bought some more taxable equipment. So we're going to tax that. And it is up to you to prove them wrong. So you have to make sure, one, that if you are doing things that impact the different accounts of interest, that one is not trash can accounting, because Lord help us if it is. But if it isn't, that you have the appropriate source document to back up why you made that entry. And the source document should have, you know, perfect world, the, um, a separately stated, uh, a separate line item showing the sales tax was charged. And if it wasn't, you need to accrue the appropriate use tax on that item. Just be aware of the presumptions because a lot of people get surprised by the fact that there are presumptions that things are taxable. But remember, the state wants to make sure that they got their fair share of mm -hmm. your pie. So all, so you always want, I always tell people, you want everything pointing in the same direction. Mm -hmm. You don't want questions. If there is a question, you want to have it documented to the nth degree what was going on. I like to say the connect the dot. Make sure you connect all the dots. So if someone runs off, it's very clear. Oh, another one of my favorite topics. I love this topic. <laughs> Most people don't love this topic. I do, because this is something that our clients get dinged on all, all the time. time. A lot of companies these days will give employees credit and debit cards to use for company purchases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just easier for them. There's a flip side to that. Yeah. Do you want, do you want to talk about it? You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about it. And then you can chime in with your favorite example because she has an example she actually loves to talk about. Um, when it relates to credit and debit cards for your business, for your clients' businesses, just make sure that they know that like we said, in addition to looking at sales, uh, the taxing authority is going to look at purchases as well, which means they're going to be looking at those credit cards and, and, and expense reports and expense statements. 
And Mary loves the example about the restaurant. Tell me your example about the restaurant. Go ahead. The, there's a there's a pro, there's a propensity for people to grab the wrong receipt. When someone goes out to lunch or dinner with their client, what they will do is you get two receipts. You get the one that says Mary had the pecan pie, Stephanie had the coconut pie, Richard had the chocolate cake, and yes, I have gone on dessert runs with people with clients. She has. So what happens is at the end of the meal, I'll get the receipt that says I'm paying $30 for all these different kinds of cake, okay? And then I'll get and I'll give them my credit card. I get it back, I sign it. I have two receipts there. I've got the one that describes the cake and I've got the one that says I paid $30 and I left the $10 tip. Most people will tell me, oh, we're good at getting the receipts. And I'll look at the receipts and it's the receipt that shows they paid $30 and left the $10 tip. It doesn't say anything about sales tax. Sales tax is on the receipt that says who ate what. Mm -hmm. It's the one that had the chocolate cake and the cook. Nobody... Now, I'm going to be for real. Nobody cares if y'all had a beer with lunch. We don't care. We just want to be able to see that you paid the eight and a quarter or wherever you are. It can be as much as 14%. We want to see that you paid the sales tax. That's all an order is looking for. Make sure that you or your client is grabbing the right receipt. Another thing we see, because we work with a lot of contractors, contractors. is you'll have a foreman who will go to the pick and save or Bucky's mm -hmm. and buy a whole bunch of water for the crew or a whole bunch of Cokes for the crew. It costs 10 bucks. He'll throw the receipt out or the receipt never makes it. My favorite is when the cashier says, do you want the receipt? And you'll hear people say, no, no. on a business card. You need the receipt. You do. The one that shows the sales tax was paid. Exactly. The other thing that, that we notice is they look at expense statements. So when you have people making all these different uh, purchases um, for the company, they need to actually have the receipt or invoice to back up that expense statement showing the separately stated sales tax was, was charged. Because if they don't have it, the presumption is that tax was not charged and an auditor is going to schedule that on the audit. And another thing is that sometimes people will put personal expenses on those cards and it's not, it's credit and debit cards. Now remember that because that was an important thing. They'll put personal expenses on there. If you have a personal expense on the company card, guess what? If there's an audit, that personal expense is fair game. And I noticed that when... Um, I had a client who was the owner of the business and he was running a lot of personal expenses through, you know, the credit card that was for the business. Things like his subscription to, to uh, Netflix, DirecTV, he even had Match.com on there, okay? And I mean, good luck trying to call up DirecTV to get a copy of an invoice with separately stated sales tax on it. He also ran his country club dues through the company credit card as well. And um, that was a taxable event in that jurisdiction. And, you know, calling up uh, the country club, they were very, they were very nice about getting me the information. But, you know, it's just a problematic kind of thing if you don't have the appropriate, what's the word people, source document to back up the fact that the item was taxed. Yeah, and, so, and and just remember when you're when you're dealing with your clients because some people are really sensitive about their personal information. We don't care. The state taxing authority doesn't care mm -hmm. that they ran that through. All they want to do is make sure that they got their piece of that pie. They got the tax. That's right. And so one of the things that people are doing now is they're using apps to capture the receipts in real time. And that's a wonderful thing because I think everybody knows about the disappearing ink on gas station receipts. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the Walmart receipt had disappearing ink. It was, it was, yeah. it's just some receipts you get them one day and like a year later, the ink is gone. Well, if you can't read it, the order can't read it. Mm -hmm. So it's a great thing to use apps where you can actually upload those receipts and have them all in one place. I know that a, a really good friend of ours, um, 
Richard takes a picture of the receipt and puts it up in Google Drive. How wonderful is that? Yeah. So there's really no excuse not to have the receipts. And I noticed that, or we both noticed that auditors are using that as a hotspot to really hammer people because they're looking at credit card statements too. That's right. And the thing about credit card statements is that there is rarely any kind of notation about sales tax on those different line items. And I ran across an order where, you know, it was a credit card statement. And for some reason, the vendor did have it on there that they charged separately stated sales tax. They had the amount. But because it was not the actual receipt or invoice, he, he said it wasn't sufficient proof. So just note that if you're ever audited, the auditor is going to be look, looking at your client's um, credit card statements as well. And so they need to make sure that they have the appropriate documentation to substantiate those purchases. Okay, this is poll question number two. So speaking of credit cards, do you deal with company credit cards? Yes, no, or, or seldom is a third option. And just a reminder, if you uh, if you do want CPE, you must participate in three out of the four uh, poll questions that we'll have. We'll leave this open for another uh, few more seconds, and then we'll close it out and turn it back over. Three, two, and one. Here we go. Oh, 90%. Yes. Yeah. So, so that's why we're telling you they're hammering home on these credit card statements and these credit cards. So make sure that there's some mechanism for getting these receipts and pick a couple at the at the end of the year, depending on the scope of your engagement, and just make sure that they act your clients actually have a procedure to capture this information because the state taxing authorities know it's a weak area. Now we get on to something else we really, really, really love because I know I love it all. Um, <laughs> because one thing that people will tell us, and I know there are, there are probably two or th three of you out there thinking this too. I don't have to worry about those, those expenses. They're not material. If they don't pay, a, if they can't prove that we can't prove that we didn't pay a dollar in sales tax, it really doesn't matter. Well, I'm going to share one thing with you and then I'm going to show and then Stephanie's going to explain why that's not quite true. Richard told us that the IRS has a materiality threshold of $75. As it relates to receipts. As it relates to receipts. State taxing authorities don't necessarily have that threshold. Down here in Texas, we don't have that threshold. No, we do not. They, I, We've seen a material a materiality threshold of one cent. That's right. So I haven't heard of any state having a $75 materiality threshold in terms of you can throw out the receipt if you pay, if the purchase was less than $75, you might be in trouble. Yes, especially if you are dealing with a sample and projection. Most people, when they're setting their materiality thresholds, um, they, they're thinking about detailed schedules where, you know, if I don't have a receipt for a $10 purchase, well, my exposure is only going to be, you know, eight, eight, 80 cents or something like that. You, you're thinking that way, but that's not necessarily what can happen to you. Your, your client can be subject to a sample and projection, which means that seemingly immaterial errors can be extrapolated out over a huge population and become something very, very material. And when you think about it, say you have, you know, 250 randomly selected transactions um, and there is an error um, and, and it becomes part of the sample error. Well, if it's extra, if the population base is all of your um, software expenses, all of the maintenance expenses, all of your office supplies, all of your janitorial services over a three to four year period, that can add up to a lot of money. And that seemingly small error extrapolated out over that huge population base can be something that can be a huge headache for you. So just note when you are making your policy or policies about document retention 
MTALE thresholds, as um, and when you're advising your clients, that you have to keep in mind that not everything is going to be a detailed review, that you may be subject to a sample and projection, and that can be something that's huge. Another thing is, um, as Mary said, we've already discussed how sometimes people will run their personal expenses through the business. Well, we have an example where somebody ran a personal expense through the business. I'll let you talk about it. And it, it led to a headache. Before I get to that, there's one thing I want to let you that you know, just a real world example. We had an error that it was a it was an invoice that was missing. It was worth two dollars. It was from a break company, uh, the little convenience store thing that a contractor did. And it was worth it was worth several like tens of thousands of dollars. And you have never seen somebody go crazy trying to find a two dollar receipt as I was trying to find that one. If your clients decide that it's immaterial and they don't want to keep up with it, one thing, a solution that you can do is at the end of the year, just pay use tax on it. Just declare it as a tax for purchase, pay the use tax on it, it's immaterial and you don't have to worry about it. If, it, if they pull an audit, all you have to do is just be able to show, hey, we don't have the receipt for it, but, but. but here it is in the use tax accrual and the tax will purchase is accrual. Mm -hmm. And then you'll be out with it. And they know about the expenses because they're looking at your GL. If you exactly. booked it in the GL, it's fair game. They're going to know what's going on with it. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the personal expenses, the private school. I got a call from a lady who said, we're being audited. And my, my boss ran his kids' private school expenses through the company. And... He doesn't want to give her that information. Do we have to? She says, if we don't, she's going to schedule him as a private individual for audit. And I said, uh, turn it over because she can. Yes, she, she can do that. She can do whatever she wants to do because he ran that through the company. It's fair game. Mm -hmm. And private school, private school uh, tuition, tuition, that's not, not taxable. taxable. Sounds like, I don't know why you just don't give, give her the invoice yes. that matches what the, what the expense is. But just remember, the end of the year, look at all these accounts. And if your client is running personal stuff through there, it's better to pull the teeth up front than it is to try to do it later. Because now we segue into the last bullet on this slide, document retention, the statute of limitations the U.S. is typically between three, three and four, four years, years absent a finding of fraud. You want to make sure that you've got your documents hemmed down at least once a year mm -hmm. because it's easier if you don't have it to rehab it and go back to the vendor the closer you are to when the transaction happened. And when we talk about document retention, we're not only talking about source documents, your purchase invoices sales invoices. We're also talking about any certificates that you may have to substantiate tax-free sales, as well as your accounting records. Don't lose that information or have it locked up because you had a system conversion. You want to make sure that you retain that information at least for the three to four years, uh, which is the standard um, statute of limitations for sales and use tax. And then we get to what we've been talking about, taxable purchases. And taxable purchases is something that a lot of people don't understand, but it's very important. Do you want to? Yeah. The thing about um, taxable purchases, these are items where sales tax is due. And sometimes you will run across um, a vendor who doesn't charge the appropriate sales tax. I've noticed uh, cases where I've run across Amazon and Amazon will have charged the appropriate state tax, but not charge the local tax. Where if you're being audited, the auditor is going to be looking for tax compliance across the board. So that means the appropriate state tax was charged and the local tax was charged. The same thing as it relates to uh, mom, pop, mom, mom, the small businesses that you have working for you. Normally we're talking about things like janitorial services or landscaping they may not be um, permitted to collect a jurisdiction's tax. They may not even know that they should, that they're providing a taxable service. It is incumbent upon you as a good corporate citizen 
and your client as good corporate citizens to realize that they are purchasing taxable items and to report the appropriate use tax on the sales and use tax return in the line item that says taxable purchases because every sales and use tax return has a line on there so you can report taxable purchases appropriately. Another thing is the federal income tax return. And we've talked about it ad nauseum, but there's another piece to it, which is why you're also not getting out of providing it. And that is in the depreciation schedules, mm -hmm. there's a section that tells the auditor when you purchase equipment, and if it is in the statute of limitations and the look back period, they're going, they can say, and they typically do, we want to see a receipt for these four or five pieces of heavy equipment that you bought. Exactly. We want to see receipts for these computers that you bought. Mm -hmm. You've got to have them and know that that federal income tax return is a, it's just a fount of information form. They're looking at the assets, asset accounts to make sure in the same vein that if you have had additions to your fleet of heavy equipment, your computers, whatever it may be, that if it is a taxable purchase that you actually pay the tax, there are instances where people will not charge you tax. And I know bane of everybody's existence, Wayfair, there are instances where an out-of-state vendor will not charge tax because they're not permitted to. They're not required to be permitted to. That doesn't mean that you get a free ride as it relates to not paying that tax. No. You still pay the tax. You pay it in the taxable purchases section. A popular question we get on YouTube is, if I paid sales tax on the receipt, do I report the purchase as a taxable purchase? The answer to that is no. If you pay the appropriate amount of sales tax, then you do not report that as a taxable purchase. If you did, you'd be paying the tax twice. The taxable purchases section is to capture transactions for which tax was not, or the appropriate amount of tax was not That's paid. Mm -hmm. And they have apps that track that now for QB Enterprise and, and QB Online. And, and there are other people that are getting into the game of tracking that. A lot of our clients track it handwritten they find an excel spreadsheet that they mm -hmm. that they use if you do it that way do the excel spreadsheet keep the invoices always keep the invoices the source documents so that if somebody wants to schedule a particular transaction you can show that you accrue the tax on it poll question number three all right i'm not exactly sure what you're seeing on the screen but it should say would you like more information about audit representation or sales tax education? <laughs> yeah, you got cut off there, Gary. Yeah, I'm not, uh, yeah, quality control. We didn't no. audit. We didn't audit this before we, uh, before we posted it. So, all right, since we are pushing up on time, I'm gonna go ahead and close this out, give you three more seconds if you'd like to uh, get that CPE, you do need to participate. Three, two, and one. Okay, now we're going to move on to the next question. And, and these are the takeaways. We are pushing up on time. We've talked about all this. We told you the importance of reconciling the sales reported via the sales tax returns with your year-end reports, including your federal income tax returns, understanding your journal entries, getting and keeping the receipts. And your source documents and having a procedure that addresses it if you if your clients don't have one reminding your clients of taxable purchases the state control the state taxing authorities know that you have them and don't forget the cloud use the cloud as much as you can things happen in texas we have hurricanes and and weather events rain events other places have tornadoes california has wildfires things happen if your stuff is in the clouds, you don't have to worry about it because here's the deal. If you don't have the documentation, they still charge a tax on it if you can't produce it. Exactly. Poll question number four. I think we had a similar uh, lack of audit on this question as well. So it should read, would you like more information about bookkeep revenue accounting automation? Oh, yeah. And so did I hear right earlier in the presentation that if Mary wins the Powerball, she's getting out of the business? 
Yes. Yes. <laughs> she I mean, is. Seriously? I may, do it for fun. I, may do it for, I may do it for fun because she I do. says that, but I know her. She <laughs> will be on a she will be on a beach somewhere, you know. Well, and I'm not gonna lie, I'll be on that beach with her. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hitting too. That's how it goes. No, uh, I I think I'd drive everybody crazy if I didn't work. She yeah. Would. Well. I wouldn't be doing sales and use tax for fun. I might find something else to do, but that's just me. All right, so we're going to close this one here. And I know there were a couple of questions. I think Richard was going to uh, read them off real quick. So Richard, it, uh, share them, share what you got. Thanks, Gary. So the first question, Mary and Stephanie, in the event of an audit, and this, the, sorry, this question comes from Robin Hone. In the event of an audit, is every individual receipt needed for a monthly software app subscription? Or have you run into auditors accepting one receipt for an entire year of costs? Oh, good question. No. No. <laughs> no, they don't accept that. I will say that sometimes that auditors have a lot of discretion. Sometimes you will run across an auditor where if they see that the vendor consistently charge, charge sales tax, they won't make you get every invoice. They'll just take a sampling of invoices. So you may be able to get out of providing every invoice, but a lot depends on the auditor that you're dealing with. You want to have it, Robin. You want to have the information. Remember, this is all about the state making sure that they got every nibble of pie they were supposed to get. Some auditors will let you get away with things. Mm -hmm. I've never had an auditor tell me, if you produce one, I'll let it go. The most permissive auditor I've had lately said, if you give me five of the 20, I'll, I'll let, let it go. go. Okay. Great answer. Thank you. And we have another one from Robin. Uh, can accountants be personally liable for sales or use tax liabilities in the same way that they may be for payroll tax liabilities? No. no. Uh, down here, we're in the fifth district. We're in the fifth circuit. Um, there's a piece of jurisprudence that says we're not responsible for the tax. That is actually the liability of the purchaser. But what they can nail you for would be penalty or interest, depending on um, depending on how bad it was. But usually, if it's just a mistake and there's nothing and there's nothing heavy cabby going on, you're not going to have many people kicking up much of a fuss. Exactly. Excellent. And then we've got one more uh, from my good friend Rachel Douchy, uh, and it says, "Mary and Stephanie, sales tax on expense. You don't mean that we should be breaking the tax out in purchases." very uh, all uppercase in the word purchases. Yes? Yes. Well, think about it, Rachel. Uh, purchases is the flip side of sales. sales. So, when, so, when it's a, so when it's a sale for you as a purchase for somebody else and vice versa, this, the taxing authority is looking at both buckets. They're looking at the sales bucket and the purchases bucket. They want to make sure that you not only collected the appropriate sales or use tax from your clients and gave them the money they also want to make sure that when you bought stuff you paid the amount of sales tax and gave them their money but when you're talking about your accounting when you're entering things into the the gl you don't have to break it out no there. you don't you don't you don't you don't that's an extra step that you don't have to do just make sure that when you when you have that invoice that it does have separately stated sales tax on it or some kind of language about all applicable Texas sales and use tax or you know, included, whatever language it is. The, but it, it, but, it varies ahead. by jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, but what you want to do is if if the vendor is including sales tax, you want them to have a statement on there that says sales tax is included mm -hmm. because if they take on the fiduciary responsibility of collecting and remitting that sales or use tax, then you're out of it. Yeah, but for when you're making entries into different accounts, into the GL, you, you don't, have, don't to have to break out the sales tax there. You just on need the to, on the purchases. You just need to have the source documents that showed it was paid. Exactly. One last question, and that is uh, also from Rachel Douchy. You're referring to sales tax on restaurant receipts for documentation purposes only. Is that correct? Uh, if you're if you're documenting, yes, because what you're doing is what when I speak of it, I'm talking about if you have the credit card statements and you have in your GL the expense of you pay sixty dollars and fifty five cents at you know dessert gallery, an auditor can pull that and say I want to see the receipt and make mm -hmm. sure that you pay sales tax on this. 
And so in that vein, you want to have a receipt that says we had five pieces of whatever pie, we paid $10 worth of sales tax. So then that person will leave that alone. Exactly. All right. Thank you, Mary and Stephanie. Appreciate it all. All right. So uh, Mary and Stephanie, they are the sales tax sisters. Now you mentioned during there, somewhere in there that um, uh, YouTube, you have something, what do you do on YouTube? We have a lovely YouTube channel called the Sales Tax Sisters YouTube channel. And uh, we put out videos about different sales and use tax issues, general business issues. And we are very, very happy that we've had, what we had it? About two years. Yeah, we've had about two years. So we've had a few uh, visitors and we are always, always hopeful for more subscribers. So if y'all are interested in some more information about this topic, please go there. Yeah, they're, they're typically, we try to do little snippet sound body things just to kind of give people information about hotspots. I know a big hotspot is taxable purchases. So if you come up with something, you think of something, you're like, oh, I need to know more about that. Hit the channel. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And then, um, and I, I don't know, if, I think both of you do also um, some training as well. Can they, can people find that on YouTube or is it a separate site somewhere? Um, the links are in all of our YouTube, the description box and all of our YouTube videos of the different courses that we have. If you want to do a self-study kind of thing, we have a couple courses um, available and it's always in the link of the YouTube video. So uh, take a look at that. We also have a few books as well about sales and use tax, especially as it relates to construction here in Texas. And the links are there too. You can also check us out at... Um, the sales tax sisters.com and all of all of our information is there as well. Yeah. And I, I find that we also do, we do one-on-ones with people. So if you want to just book 30 minutes where you talk about a specific, in, where you have a working session, where we talk about a specific issue, walk you through it, give you some ideas. That's, you, we take care of that also. If you go to our website and just book some time. Okay, great. And I just dropped that into the chat. So if anybody is looking for those two, um, those two sites, and then the, or search on YouTube, the Sales Tax Sisters. So thank you both for sharing your information and your knowledge uh, with all of us today. I think I failed to mention Bookkeep as a sponsor of this session, and we certainly uh, appreciate Bookkeep supporting this uh, supporting this effort. So I encourage everybody to go find them on the web. And uh, Mary and Stephanie, we'll see you guys in Vegas at uh, QB Connect in a couple of weeks. Y'all ready? All right. Well, have a great <laughs> Thanksgiving. Have a great holiday. Don't forget to register for their session, Sales Tax Demystified. Yes. Oh, all right. Looking forward to it. We'll see y'all out there. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you.